uh, the Pops's oh, Trade Craft Week. Uh, I think, oh, I have to do this, the intro. Today's session is a round table focusing on the promotion of Indigenous business and a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be posted on PAFSO's YouTube channel less, later date. We acknowledge that the PAFSO is hosting the Tradecraft Week on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and PAFSO acknowledges them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. So those of you who don't know me, most people do. I'm Tammy Ames. I'm the Senior Trade Commissioner in Costa Rica, and I'm also the Communications Director of PAFSO, and I'm on the Executive, um, obviously a Career Trade Commissioner, hence doing the trade, trade session. And today we're going to talk a bit about promotion of Aboriginal business, how we do it, the challenges, the best practices. And we'll have four speakers today uh, to talk about their experiences, people with um, who've been doing this for a bit. We have Francis Suot from, you're in Beijing now, so you were in Auckland. Nicole Van Hoel from the Vancouver RO, Jerome Pichella from Seattle. Uh, you're, I think, acting calm these days, if I remember. And <laughs> she's normally STC. And Sarah Quigley, who is uh, STC in Sydney. And these are all people who've undertaken projects. So each one is going to get a chance to tell you a bit about who they are, what they do, and why they took up this challenge. We know headquarters has flagged indigenous business as one of the underrepresented groups they want us to promote. There's a little, little pot of money that they give us to undertake projects and we all have to pick and choose where our priorities are. So I'm interested in the backgrounds of why this popped up for your posts in particular. Uh, Francis, you can start. Okay, bye. merci Amy. Um... Uh, good morning, good evening from uh, Beijing, China. So I have to say at the beginning that I need to apologize a little bit. I've been sick all week. It's not COVID related or anything like this. It's just the, the Chinese bug that's been going around uh, the school and the office. And I also forgot my notes at the office yesterday. So hopefully it won't be too disorganized. My intervention won't be too, too disorganized. Um, so you asked us to like, kind of organize our thoughts in a few different categories. So a little bit about me first. Uh, so after a, few, after a few years in the private sector, I joined Foreign Affairs in 2003. Um, and then I went to a posting in Taiwan from 2007, 2010. Uh, was SDC in Guangzhou from 2010, 2013. Uh, they brought me back to the mothership in 2013, 15 to please don't hate me to build Strategia. And uh, then, <laughs> then I had the great opportunity to go open our, our, um, our office in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, which was like a great, uh, great opportunity to work on FPDS, consular, trade, um, IT, admin, you name it. I was sometimes on all four running wires through the walls and organizing you know, our, our IT systems. And then after that, um, my nice DG at the time said, uh, Francis, you need to take a break. What about New Zealand? Uh, and I kind of jumped at the opportunity. Uh, so went to Auckland for four years. And that's where the most part of the indigenous work that I've been doing was, uh, was held. And now since last August, after a nice three weeks of quarantine, in Shanghai eating you know, Chinese university cafeteria food for three weeks. Um, I'm now in Beijing being counselor and senior trade commissioner in our team here. So shameless plug, I know this is, you know, this is recorded, so hopefully uh, more people will see it than you know, the converted that I see here um, live this morning. Um, shameless plug. Um, if it, it is posting season, so if you are considering a posting in China, I know you no know, language training for Mandarin might sound like a daunting, daunting task for two years, but it's something that it can nobody can take away from you after. And it's really uh, so I did that uh, back in 2005 to seven. And again, uh, 
China might seem difficult at times, work-wise and personal-wise, but it is really something uh, career-wise that can um, that can be of benefit to you. So, sorry for the long introduction, but uh, <clears throat> so back in uh, I'll go back to my Auckland, uh, New Zealand days. So why did I decide to go on to like look into indigenous affairs? So. When I first arrived in Auckland, coming from Cambodia, uh, it was quite a, a stark difference. Like everything works, people speak the same language, um, there's no issues, you're kind of working nine to five. Um, and so I was uh, looking at this and like where, as a trade commissioner, like where can I make a difference? And at the time, um, the government just released its, you know, indigenous, reconciliation, you name it, policies and things like that. And of course, the environment in New Zealand with, you know, 18% of the population being Maori, um, it was a great opportunity. And at the time I saw that the, the, uh, the economy, the Maori economy was, you know, there were a whole bunch of reports that were coming out saying it was worth like 50 plus billion dollars. It was growing at a rate of 20%. I forget the numbers, but like, it was growing much faster than the regular economy. And I quickly realized, you know, talking to my home at the time and looking around, like we hadn't, we didn't do anything on that front. Like we knew uh, the, the, the indigenous knowledge or the Maori knowledge that we had as the two missions in Wellington and Auckland was mostly on the policy side and the human rights issue and on a human rights side. We knew a bunch of um, lawyers, we knew, professors, you know, academics and things like, but on the business side of things, nothing. So I decided, okay, well, let's start to look into this. And uh, what kind of pushed me to do this is when for the World Indigenous Business Forum was held in New Zealand in 2018. And it was the first um, indigenous business mission led by a, uh, a federal minister, was supposed to be a minister at the time, but it ended up being a parliamentary secretary um, that we ever undertook as a federal government. So we had about 40 representatives, indigenous representatives from Canada to come to New Zealand. And I quickly realized like, oh, holy crap, like what am I gonna do? Like, <laughs> I need, those people need to meet people. And we didn't have, you know, a database of Maori companies or anything like this. So. There was a lot of groundwork, like legwork that had to be done at the beginning. Um, and it came out very positive on several fronts. Unfortunately, on the business side of things, you know, if you're talking KPIs and you know, EOFs and leads and service requests, it was a bit difficult to get the results that we expected in that just because it was the first time that we had such such a mission, and the 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 the, the indigenous companies from Canada were not like either ready or were not were not used to be exposed to the international nature of business. So, for a lot of them, it was a lot of fact finding missions. But those links and those networkings that we organize still remain to this day. So I'm still quite hopeful that, you know, these deals and people are still talking and it's, it's a small world and it's a small network and everybody knows everybody very quickly. So, but you, you still need to build those networks, you know, one by one. So that's the why, why I ended up working with, with First Nations in Canada. And it continued, you know, pre-pandemic, the, the World Indigenous Business Forum was then held in Vancouver the following year where I brought a delegation from New Zealand and also a whole bunch of things that were being done um, on the policy side. It was at the time of the CPTPP with a, an indigenous chapter in it. I was working closely with Chile, uh, Canada and New Zealand for the um, Inclusive Trade Action Group, which is uh, a little group that was put together uh, <coughs> with like-minded, excuse me. <coughs> And uh, so, so it continued, like the ball was rolling and things were kind of moving along. The hard part though in New Zealand is that it's, it is perceived as far, which it is. 
and costly, which it is. Uh, but it's also a land of, um, it's a mature market. Um, and, and companies from Canada will, you know, they, New Zealand constantly ranks like number one or two in the world in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the best place to do business in the world. And it is true. I mean, it works. You get there. And I've seen deals being done in two weeks. So the thing, you know, the, the, the money that you invest as a, as a company, of course, you know, you'll always be attracted to, to Seattle or Oklahoma or, you know, places like this closer to home. Uh, but New Zealand is really low hanging fruit and they would be very open to talk to First Nations, Métis and, <clears throat> and Inuit businesses. Um, there is a strong link there. Um, and, and they are very open to it. It was, I was always amazed when, um, you know, I've had, when I was in New Zealand, there was several um, delegations, Mi'kmaq delegations coming, led by provincial representatives or, or from BC and things like that. The doors are just wide open. I mean, you just pick up the phone and say, I have these people coming here from the Mi'kmaq delegation from, from PEI. Like, yeah, okay. And I could meet like the highest people or like businesses in New Zealand very, very, very easily. It was not the same if I had a delegation coming from, you know, a, a clean tech delegation from Manitoba or something. It was much harder. Now, the third part um, about the challenges, and there are several. So, <coughs> excuse me again. Ugh. So, at the beginning, again, going back to 2017, back at HQ, we were not equipped to identify which companies were indigenous. We started to do the work back in B branch, but we didn't know who they were. Not that we didn't care, it was just that we would treat these companies as any other companies. But because of this government priority, we had to reorganize our things into trio, how to identify, like we had done the work for women in business, for LGBTQ, but now we have to do some, some legwork in this. But part of the challenge, and Nicole will can attest to this, is that these companies are not in Vancouver. They're not in Toronto. Some of them are, they're not in Toronto. They're not in Montreal, right? You need to get out, you know, get into your car, your plane, and go to the Yukon, and go to Shikutsumi, and go to Hertz, right? Uh, but with the level of budget that we have, it's really difficult to do that. Um, it's not, so I don't have a solution for this now, and COVID obviously did not help, but it was really a challenge to try to identify these companies uh, to, to go where they are. Um, another challenge, and I don't mean to be, uh, you know, I need to be careful in what I say here. Um, we have a lot of, a, a lot of our people, our foreign service officers currently in the department are coming from Vancouver, they're coming from Toronto, they're coming from Ottawa, they're coming from Montreal. We don't have a lot of them coming from Northern Alberta, right? We don't have a lot of, there, there's not a lot of us who are coming from Sudbury, right? There are a few, but the exposure to the indigenous life within our department is, uh, is small. Now I have the opportunity, I, I, so little story, I was born in Abitibi, but my parents were, I grew up like on, on the side of the Hudson Bay. Like no trees, no nothing, pre-James Bay development. So like I kind of grew up in, in a shack. Uh, my dad was a principal um, for uh, the schools there. It was like indigenous community. And I grew up there until I was three, four years old. I don't remember any of it, but I do have pictures from my parents. And with me there with the... Uh, <clears throat> With the First Nations group that were there. So I kind of have this sensitivity about indigenous 
you know, realities. Uh, but it's, it's, it's something that is lacking um, in our department, I think. It's changing. And I don't know for those of you who will have seen or heard my intervention after the, uh, <clears throat> the Paso inter intervention after <clears throat> back in June. It's not a two hour online training that's gonna change that. We need to go out and go meet and I'm not saying live in indigenous communities, but you need to go out and meet with them. You need to go out and see the reality. And that's gonna make a big difference on how we can approach this because there's also another challenge where when you, when you go out and you, 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 you meet with indigenous businesses and you have like a maple leaf on your lapel here, uh, the reaction, varies greatly from communities to community. I've had one, ex and you know, this is a, a path, so this is like an internal thing. I've had people come to me and like literally pushing me in a corner saying, why are you doing this? What's in it for you? And I was just trying to explain like, no, no, this is my job. This is part of what I'm supposed to be doing, right? You know, I was not gonna start talking about KPIs and stuff, but you know, I'm trying to help you, but they could not believe it. Like, what is it, what's in it for you? So there's, there's all this, um, cette, une genre de réticence, si on veut, mais il faut passer par-dessus ça. Puis, afin de passer par-dessus ça, c'est pas en allant, encore une fois, à White Horse ou à Yellowknife once a year, and then people change, and then somebody else goes the year after, and then the, the, the indigenous, practices rests a lot on, on personal, uh, personal connection. And that's what I was able to gain in New Zealand because now it's kind of funny. Um, the, the <laughs> you need to build this, these personal connections and it takes time. So I just heard this week that um, the, the, the New Zealand foreign minister, um, uh, Nanaya Mahuta, who used to be uh, the, the, the minister for Maori development, was just asking about me. He's like, so how's Francis doing in New Zealand? And I'm just like, what? <laughs> and, you know, it's like she's on, she's on my Twitter and like, you know, it's, 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 it's quite funny. But it, this just to show how long of a way it can go if you do build these personal connections. Again, it's not all about um, KPIs. And that's, that's the fight that I was fighting with HQ because these things will take a long time. This is an investment that we need to make now in order to get results perhaps 10 years from now. I won't get, I won't get a KPI and I don't care. But it is something that, it is a work that needs to be done. It's a lot of legwork but it's, it's, it's investment that we need to make for the long term. So um, about best practices, um, you know, I kind of alluded to a few things, you know, it's engage early and often. If you, once you arrive in, in, in your new posting, go out, do, do engage and don't, just don't go because, you know, you, 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 you want to go once because your home said so, but you need to go back, right? One other thing, like one thing that I felt that is truly valued in this building of like this personal relationship is really be yourself. Don't try to play, um, don't try to play a role of the diplomat or anything like that. Just be yourself, be true to yourself, show who you are and they will appreciate that. Try to make that personal linkages. Like, where are you from? Where did you grow up? For me, I had the advantage of saying that, that I grew up in a place where like nobody was like, and people were like, whoa. <clears throat> and they were asking questions and they could relate, right? So they, they could relate and they could build that, that relationship with me very quickly. But, you know, it takes time. You need to go again early and often. Read a lot, not just about where you are, but read about our history in Canada, our indigenous history know about it and try to learn about it. Also listen 
listen to what our indigenous communities have to say and also where you are in the country where you're posted at. Learn about their history, how it works, how it came about. Why is this real reality now? You'll learn a, a whole bunch of things. Um, and also, again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before with KPIs and things like that. You need to be creative, okay? Uh, because sometimes it's, it will be really hard to have a clean, an indigenous clean tech delegation. So I know there's one, you know, a woman, that there's, there's a mission that will be going to New Zealand, Australia in December, I think. I don't know where, where that's at, but Sarah might talk about it a bit later. And I see Maria there. Hi, Maria. My, uh, there as well. But it's kind of a hodgepodge of like women in business and indigenous. And the, it's really hard to have a focused business mission that will go to where you are because of um, the, 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 we don't have in Canada, we don't have enough. Uh, I think there is enough, but that's my own perspective. But we don't have enough reach in Canada yet to bring a group of indigenous companies together in one sector. So it's, it's always a bit mixed up and it makes it harder to go uh, to a, an event in oil and gas, right? Uh, so that's that's a challenge. So that's where you need to be creative in trying to make that work and make the, the, the connections and on where you are. And when I say also, and that will be my last point, when I say also be creative. So I come, like I have a trade background, although I was doing a lot of FPDS, FPDS stuff in the in the past and, and consular. Um, it is it is a it is a team effort. Um, meaning all sec all parts of the embassy, high commission, consulate, where you are, needs to be involved in this. So I'll give you uh, uh, one, one of the, the success, I think, or one of the things that I did when we had the World Indigenous Business Forum. Um, I tried hard to get, so my, my idea was, I want to get a, um, a, a First Nation artist to come for the event. And at that time, I learned about, you know, Maori carving, you know, wood carving and techniques and stuff. And I said, wouldn't it be great to have a Canadian wood carver that would come for the event and would train, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a wood carving school in New Zealand that would train the students there with, you know, First Nations carving techniques. And what happens, like, so I got a guy to come for a month and he was there, he was teaching the school, at the school, and during the week of the event itself, he had a booth where he and Amari Carver would work, were both working on a piece, which was presented at the closing ceremony, ceremony and everything. So again, nothing to do with trade, right? But it had everything to do with relation building, and that piece now is exposed at the, um, at the Institute of Wood Carving itself, it, it, can, it can be bought for about 30 to $40,000. They made small like bronze replicas of it that go for about five to $6,000. And it's, it's just amazing. And that these pieces are still there. I was not able to get one for myself, unfortunately, um, but I'm still working at it. So, all of that to say, it takes everybody, and I talked about FPDS, but it's not only that, it's trade policy, right? So all together, we need to be working on these with like the ultimate goal, which is trying to help indigenous businesses and take out the, the we, we often have like the, at Global Affairs, um, we view indigenous affairs as a human rights issue, and we're pretty good at it. But there's this whole other part of let's get, and, and that's what New Zealand understood 30 years ago. Let's try to get these people, these people, I shouldn't say that, like these indigenous communities and businesses uh, out to market.
market so they can grow on their own. And that will make a bigger difference than just giving funds and assistance. So that's my, sorry, I kind of went a bit long, but um, <laughs> that's, that's my, uh, that's my your, talk for today. That's your story. Yeah. Um, I, th I think you have a, a lot of uh, interesting things and comments. I saw some heads nodding that others will uh, agree with you. So I'm going to flip over to Nicole. She's uh, in Vancouver and she's got the other side because she sees these companies before they hit most of us out here at Post. And uh, that comes with its own set of challenges, including, as Francis noted, our budgets are slashed. How do you get to the Yukon when they they think one trip a year of three days should be sufficient for you or something ridiculous. So go ahead, Nicole, give us a bit of your background and, and what it's like working in Vancouver. For sure. Thanks, Tammy. And someone just shout if you can't hear well, because it's always the worst to be talking on video and find that out a few minutes in. So I'm Nicole. I have joined the department about 12, 13 years ago. Worked in Ottawa, worked out of Germany, Ottawa again, and then came to the regional office for BC and the Yukon in 2016. I became non-rotational, but Tammy still invited me, so thanks, Tammy. And I'd like to talk a bit about why we work with Indigenous businesses. So I should give a shout out to Lauren Hoshka, who was my predecessor here, and she had already started some of that work. So our office is in the fortunate position of doing it before it became a thing that the department did. So that was a nice base to build on. And one of the things I appreciate so much about working with Indigenous businesses is that you have the triple bottom line. So you're talking about people, planets, and profits. It's not just what can you sell. Someone might stop a meeting or an event, and there might be a blessing or a prayer or we're reminded to think of the homeless people on the downtown east side or the changing of the seasons. So I find... Sometimes there's a temptation, like there's just so much work all the time, you kind of become a little bit robotic, and it really calls you back to your humanity. So if you're looking for a reason to get involved, and that appeals to you, that might be one. Um, the other one would be to be a government official playing a positive role for Indigenous individuals and communities instead of the negative one that has been played for so many years. I think that's definitely worth doing as well. And also to bring some learning and understanding. So to learn ourselves and bring that into the TCS, as well as to bring some education to people on topics they might be less familiar with. So for example, a lot of the businesses that I work with, they can't necessarily get a loan to start up their business, especially if they're on reserve, because you can't put up your house for a loan. So a lot of these businesses are starting loans on their credit cards, and then they find they need to expand, but they're already maxed out on their credit cards. And there are so many like financial hurdles that they're facing that if they're facing like a technical issue on why they can't apply for our program, can export, you know, maybe there's some explanation that I can bring to our headquarters and they will reverse an auto rejection and then consider someone's application, which is a case uh, that happened. So, or explaining to people that there is a difference between working with a business that might be owned by an Indigenous individual. There are also businesses that are owned by bands or nations. So the structures look different. Some of the goals are different. Um, there might be more of a community wellness orientation for the business. So then another role I think that we play here is education. There are a lot of misconceptions out there. Uh, sometimes those are furthered by certain organizations, not ours. That's not who I'm thinking of. But uh, for example, at events, I've had people after speakers come up to me and then say, oh, so nations can trade to nations without tariffs. And I'm like, well, that's not the case. Or there is a thing called the J Treaty with the US, which means indigenous people from Canada who can prove certain lineage can go and work and live in the US, but not vice versa. So like a lot of nuances. And some people think that that kind of treaty applies to goods, but it doesn't. Um, so just making people aware of what they can and can't access, um, sharing with people how they can feed into free trade initiatives, if they have concerns, explaining what the carve-outs are about for Indigenous people, that all kind of feeds into the education. And then the other education bit is, I think, for companies that are a bit new to exports. So I get a lot of maybe earlier stage questions than we normally might work on in the Trade Commissioner Service, but I think it's important to not throw up barriers or try to bring down barriers um, and see how we can serve companies, even if they're a little bit earlier on than we normally might. 
So I get a lot of technical questions, things about customs brokers. I've been making friends with a lot of customs brokers, um, tariffs, things like that. I know there are a couple of posts who are strong in that, but if your post is, like, I would love to hear from you. So, so we've mentioned a couple of projects already. Francis mentioned the World Indigenous Business Forum. Um, so I did some work with him and headquarters and other people coming in um, on things like that. And I think through several initiatives like that, as well as working with the Trade Accelerator Program here that waives the fee for Indigenous businesses and helps people come up with export plans, uh, we've been seeing a bit of a snowball effect. Like at first, maybe you've got one or two clients and then it snowballs in six months to like three or four. And then the next year you're getting like four times that annually and then just more and more. Because once you're known, although people are spread out geographically, they're pretty connected. Like there's a network of Canadian Indigenous business women that talk every month. And if you do a good job for one of them, they're gonna send their friends to you. So I think that's one way of kind of dealing with the small budgets, et cetera. Okay, I think Jerome's gonna talk about a project that we're working on um, between kind of ROPAC and Seattle or the regional office and Seattle. Um, and then one of the things I'd like to highlight about that is if there's anything your post can do that would help companies in professional services or consumer goods, which are two areas that are often not even covered, at post, um, or if they are, it's very reactively. Like a lot of the clients are falling into those areas. Another one would be ag and processed foods, which is a very weird one for us because most regional offices don't cover it. Um, yet, Agriculture Canada doesn't really have the same export mandate as we do, so they're not doing as much work in exports because they have a lot of other things to do. Um, so I'm like very aware of and working with a couple companies in that space. So again, if there's anything you have in that space, would love to hear about it. Um, if there's something you want to do around like fashion, music, arts, if there are ways of working with public affairs, which is something that Francis mentioned, um, again, would love to hear about that. I think it's good to chat early on because uh, there's a bit of a deluge of recruitment requests that happen at the regional office. I think in 15 days, I had like one every day. It wasn't all for Indigenous business. I cover other things as well. Um, but at a certain point, people get recruitment fatigue and a few things coming up in five days with a deadline versus someone else who was organized and got it to us like six weeks in advance. Uh, you can kind of see where I'm going with that. I think maybe the last thing I'll share is that I like to talk about diverse groups and diversity. Um, we had some feedback that's just more affirming. Um, I know our government has been saying underrepresented groups for a long time. We had someone at another regional office say maybe underrepresented in our client base or in the way that we think about exports, because a lot of um, nations, bands, individuals have said things like we have traded historically, we're a trading people. There was a lot of damage inflicted by Canadian society, the government, religious groups um, that dampened a lot of that. But I think there's a lot of like pride and resilience coming out. So, again, just to speak about diverse groups. And people have also said that they don't want to be lumped in with all the other groups. So if you're going in, like, not to tell people, oh, we work with diverse groups or underrepresented groups, just, hey, we're trying to do a better job understanding Indigenous businesses, your needs, how we can support you. If there's something we know that can be helpful to you in turn, you know, we're here to share. Great. Some good advice. Um, next up, Seattle. We're just going to hop across the border. <laughs> Jerome can give us a little bit of his perspective, what they've been doing uh, in Seattle. Thank you, Tam. Uh, hi, everybody. A lot of people that I see whom I haven't met, whom I haven't seen in a long time, so it's great to know that you're listening and you're interested. I have copious notes, and Francis and Nicole have covered a lot of my copious notes, so that's good. I'm going to try not to be too repetitive. Um, so who am I? I've been in the department since 2005. Before that, I spent six years at EDC. Uh, my first posting was Senior Trade Commissioner in Morocco in 2008, then went on to be Deputy Director of the Trade Team and Counselor for Science and Technology in Washington, DC. Then five years in Colorado, and now it's been two years in Seattle. So it's been a while, and it's been mostly in the United States. My, my interest in working with First Nations I'm not like Francis, I don't have you know, that fantastic plan and, and I'm all about relations for better or for worse. And there are two people that I met within the scope of a few months when I was in Washington uh, and who became really close friends. One is American, she's Cherokee, and the other one comes from a tribe in the middle of me right now in, uh, in Northern BC. 
And in both cases, I realized that I knew absolutely nothing about the reality in which they had been brought up and, and the reality of their tribes. And so that piques my interest. Then I moved to Colorado and, and all the states that I covered have a sizable First Nation population. Um, and one thing that happened, a little click, and that goes to what CJ is saying for best practices for reaching and promoting indig indig indigenous business. I got contacted by a consultant from Northern Alberta who was representing several tribes. And of course, with consultants, you never know how they are. But once I realized that Patrick was legit, uh, I started working with him. And him having those connections with the tribe helped me and my staff understand the reality of the tribes and see how we could work together. Um, and, and that led to successes when we talked about the tribe. But I needed that bridge in order to be able to really understand what the needs were and how we could serve those, those clients. I would not have been able to do it otherwise. One thing that I realized quickly, Francis talked about that, is that the tribe to tribe connection is really important. Uh, so the biggest success that we had was with a company from Northern Alberta called ProPipe. And working with Dallas, we put them in touch with a tribe in Oklahoma. And since then there was a very large investment, so CDIA in Oklahoma and the tribe from, and from um, Alberta has been supplying their heavy machinery to that new plant. Where am I going with that? We were able to get, so I had the consultant who knew the Canadian tribe really well, but could talk, I could talk to them through him and Dallas did the same with their contacts among the tribes in Oklahoma. And so we had that bridge that was made. It made things more complicated, but it ended up working. Sectors, Nicole covered it so well. Um, forestry, consumer goods, food and beverages, uh, professional services such as you know, investment funds in real estate. Those are all great. That's the bread and butter of most of the First Nations companies that I've worked with in Canada. Those are not priority sectors for practically anyone in the United States and there I say most of the world. So that requires you to be creative. Uh, that requires you to have local experts that you can use, alternate service providers, trusted consultants in order to, uh, to, to bridge that gap. Sarah, I'm mindful of the time because I don't want to, to talk too much and I want you to have time to shine. Um, one, initiative that Nicole and I led last year was a pilot project for new exporters from tribes from BC and Yukon in food and beverages and consumer goods. It was really hit and miss. Some clients were not export ready and we were not to bring them, and we're not able to bring them to export readiness. Others, uh, if you take a woman owned micro company from Yukon, Nicole and my local contacts did not stop and they went beyond our traditional services and they got them export ready, but it took a year because uh, we started from nothing, but their products was great and we believed in them. And now they're just about to enter mar market in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So it, it does take time. It does take dedication. The last point I'll make is on what Francis talked about, uh, the link between FPDS and, and traditional trade commissioner service and trade advocacy. Three years ago in Montana, I organized a seminar on rural health and with a focus on First Nations, realizing that the Blackfoot tribe is, is scattered between, uh, to them it's one nation, but to us it's Alberta, Saskatchewan, North Dakota, and Montana. We invited their leaders. Uh, I had health speakers from provinces that would come and we really focused on that. And you're going to say this is not trade commissioner work. I'll say, yep, you're right, it's not. However, what did it give us? It created an extremely strong relationship with the governor of the state, with the lieutenant governor, and with pretty much all elected officials that attended, whether they were Democrats or Republicans. And then I was able to use that when we were you know, uh, conducting advocacy about NAFTA, about border issues, about trade tariffs on steel and aluminum, you name it, because it's been such a mess in the US those past few years on trade advocacy, but I knew that through those efforts, I could rely on all, on all the elected officials from Montana, 
whatever their politi political affiliation was. And that, I think, is much worth it. Thanks for listening. Sarah, go ahead. Thanks. Yep, Sarah, you can uh, go ahead and give us a little bit of your background and what you guys are up to down in Australia. Down under. Uh, thanks, Tammy. And thanks to um, all three of you, Nicole, Francis, and Jerome. I couldn't agree more with your points. I think we're all sort of working with the same uh, background and working towards the same goals and are meeting the same challenges along the way. Um, I just wanted to kick off because I thought it might be interesting for those on the call that um, the Sydney coastline is traditional land of the Gadigal people. And so just paying respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Um, I've been a trade commissioner or TC slash lawyer in the department for about 15 years. Um, I was in Washington uh, at the same time as Jerome. I was in Vancouver with Nicole and um, a couple of TDs in uh, New Zealand and Australia and then landed here in Sydney, so worked with Francis. So it's a, a happy, familiar family here uh, today. Um, look, I inherited the Indigenous export file, so to speak, from my predecessor, uh, Marc-Andre Hawk, who had just started um, around the same time probably as Francis to sort of build up the network here in Australia to see if there was something we could do to assist Canadian uh, indigenous exporters. Um, armed with uh, a couple of contacts he had given me and a few contacts in Canada, we sort of sort of threw an event at the wall, so to speak, to see if it would stick, tried to bring some indigenous Canadian businesses together with some Australian businesses, just on a best practices sharing basis. Um, we weren't really sure how to go hardcore to B2Bs yet because we just didn't have a strong enough relationship with a lot of the Indigenous companies. Um, and the outcome of the eye to eye really sort of shocked us that the an eye to eye Indigenous to Indigenous meeting, the eye to eye value was enormous and it caused us to rethink how we were going to attack this for the next few years. Um, we knew that Canadian Indigenous businesses through working with people like Nicole um, are contributing greatly to the Canadian economy, but only a fraction of them are exporting and only a fraction of that fraction are actually ready to leap into a market as far away as Australia. So um, how could we adapt our current systems or support in the TCS to help them? Um, somebody's mentioned it before, I think it might have been Nicole, but um, mentorship's a big thing. So for those Canadian companies that are almost ready to be clients or they're almost ready to export, um, like let's bend the rules. Let's, uh, let's grab them, let's mentor them, let's get them over that line in the spirit of inclusive trade. Um, they're almost there and Nicole's a champion of this. I wish I could say it was my idea, but you know, on the last mission we did, Nicole said, these two out of your 10 are, they're almost there, Sarah, I think you should work with them. And we were happy to, and, and they got there within the boundaries of the mission. Um, so I think that's um, one challenge that we, we can assist with. Um, somebody already mentioned cash flow or capital, lack of intergener intergenerational wealth. So anything we can do to assist there to set up, whether it's EDC or traditional banks that we can give um, context to, I think that's really important. Um, and then a common challenge we face is, uh, you know, we hear a lot from the businesses that um, navigating the mainstream support system is really difficult. And um, they tend to go to sort of access uh, indigenous specific support um, rather than just the mainstream support. And so I think it's our job to sort of guide them and say, you know, Nicole mentioned the uh, accelerator program or can export like, yeah, it's actually pretty easy to apply for it. And here's how it works. Like just extra pushing. There's a, a real concept that the, the paperwork is frustratingly time consuming and actually for can export it's not that bad. So I think we can sort of assist there. Um, best practices we've found, I would just go with tailoring services. It kind of binds onto what I just talked about, but we do give personalized service to every TCS client, of course, but sort of going the extra mile, um, like when we do education sessions that lead up to VTMs, um, have it be Indigenous led. So Indigenous law firms are presenting and, um, you know, uh, a session on tendering government contracts, like how would they work with an Australian company to tender for a, a government contract here or a set aside? Um, really Indigenous led and Indigenous specific. I think is, excuse me, important. Um, and then on matching B2Bs, I would just 
you know, shout out to what friends Francis said, it's not really about the KPI at the end of the day, although it's always about the KPI, but, um, you know, the B2Bs in the Indigenous um, business stratosphere is really about um, social enterprise and social impact. And they care as much about the bottom dollar as they do about giving back to their community and, and impact of their product or service on the community. So I think that's a lesson we need to learn in how we approach and what's important to them. Like on a traditional VTM with BT, B2Bs, like I'm, we're doing one with uh, Asia Pacific Foundation right now, um, the vast majority of the companies, there's 20 of them, they're not actually looking for the end user as a B2B. They're looking for resources or to create an ecosystem, like another indigenous business maybe that's in their sector that they could talk to, learn best practices. Like it's very much a cultural exchange and a business exchange sort of all, all in one. Um, the only other thing I wanted to note was just a couple of ideas for other missions. Um, people have mentioned it, but partnering, uh, don't do this alone. Um, our value add is not logistics. So I've had so many wonderful partners in the past year, like EDC has come on board a couple of times to provide their platform for B2Bs so that we're not running around doing logistics with, you know, 20 Canadian companies times 60 meetings or something. So that's been really great. Uh, Canadian Indigenous organizations like uh, CABC and CAMPC are wonderful to work with. They're happy, they're, they're really engaged in any ideas you want um, and they have a bit of funding sometimes through can export. And so they're pretty motivated to work with us. Um, and then find your local network. Uh, Francis mentioned that multiple times, but um, you know, they're, the local network is really looking for a sustainable relationship. They couldn't care less about our rotationality or rather they do care. They don't, they don't want this to be a passing relationship, right? Um, it's nice to meet Sarah, but Sarah's gone in four years. So how do we make this sustainable? So um, we've actually, the two main groups we work with here in Australia, Supply Nation and Kinaway, which is a chamber of commerce, but it's a, another supplier diversity group. Um, They've both asked, they approached us, and again, wish it was my idea. I think it's a great one. They came at me with, can we do an MOU? And I was like, well, sure, but I'm going to work with you anyway. It's like, what's the purpose of a non-binding agreement? Um, but it's really, really important to them that there's something on paper that when we're gone, this relationship between the consulate and their groups uh, will live on. And so uh, just agreeing to create these MOUs with both those organizations has caused them to go from being a good contact who was willing to work with us to now throwing open their doors and saying, you know, when are you bringing next de delegation? Let's get some booths on the floor. Let's set up B2B. We'll run it for you. Like, it's just so much more access because now there's trust. So I'll pause there. Okay, That's great. Lots of uh, good things. Something I'll raise um, in sort of in general, there's been a lot of talk about the, as Sarah called it, eye to eye, the Indigenous groups connecting with Indigenous groups. But if you're someone like CJ, who's in Barcelona, that's not, you know, that's not what's happening there. So do you say, well, right now, the Canadian Indigenous business environment, it's not really ready to just be tossed in, like, you know, you're part of 50, you know, a bunch of food suppliers or ag businesses from all over Canada, and you're just another one? Or are we really only at the point yet that the Canadian infrastructure, if you will, or it can really only work at that Indigenous to Indigenous level? Like, how do you see that business community? Is there an opportunity for them to just start selling something in the Netherlands to a general, you know, Dutch importer, or is that not really, are we not really there yet? I see Nicole has her hand up. Yeah, and I'm glad you asked. Thank you for the question. Um, I have clients with different approaches. Some of them really want that Indigenous to Indigenous connections and how can we work together and partner. And others are like, please do not pigeonhole me. We are not trying to sell just to other Indigenous businesses. Um, for example, I have a fashion client. So they do design that comes out of their culture but it's also kind of new and it's a way of for anybody to wear and experience Coast Salish design 
So they're saying like, we don't want to be on the platforms that are indigenous e-commerce platforms. We want to sell to anybody and everybody. So kind of starting with the US and looking at maybe London, um, Paris, maybe Germany. So there's a lot of interest in Europe, I think, especially from the kind of fashion, clothing, um, soaps and personal hygiene kind of items, like cosmetic kind of industry things, um, because certain countries in Europe like are willing to play a premium, especially for things that have either indigenous connection or are more environmental. So anything you can do again in the consumer goods space would be fantastic <laughs> and happy to chat with anyone after the fact um, about that. If anyone else wants to comment about your missions to where some of us or has questions or just leap in, it's very much free for all at this point. Um, I, I noticed when you said building connections between groups, that that's very much what you know, you think New Zealand, well, that's like, like Canada, you know, you just go and you sell your stuff. Whereas we're here in Central America, we're saying, no, you can't just walk in, they want to know you. We can't just call people in Honduras and say, hey, tell me everything and what you want to buy, and I'll sell it to you. They want to know you, they want to see you, they want to get to know you. And so I think it's, it's quite different from what we're used to in the North America. Like, here's my product in the elevator, 10 minutes. Do you want to buy it? The price is right. Let's go. It doesn't work that way in some of these communities. Uh, Claudio, you have your hand up. Hi. Um, thanks, Tammy. And um, I'm going to preface what I'm going to say by, by just commenting on the fact that I had a long day and I've been uh, sipping wine while, while listening to this. So <laughs> this may be the wine talking, but uh, I'm really glad that we're, we're just a, a small group and uh, I'm looking at the participants here and uh, I recognize a lot of names, um, people have crossed paths with, so it, it's nice to have a, a bit of a, a, a huddle type of atmosphere. Um, all, the, all the points were great. And um, I'm gonna take you up on your offer just to, offer, uh, just to speak about the, the reality in, in, in Colombia. Um, I think that, you know, Jerome, Sarah, uh, Francis, uh, are all and Nicole are all in in uh, fairly industrialized countries. <laughs> uh, so when when you work in in Colombia, I think we're starting from a much lower base. Um, that the, there there's no constitutional guarantees or rights for for indigenous groups here. Um, and often when you when you engage with them, we're really at uh, a very basic uh, and primal state of of talking about economic empowerment. Uh, so uh, company formation, uh, and, and they're not really export ready by any means or ready to do international trade. So um, I, I found that to be challenging. We, we've also had to deal a lot with um, the dynamic of, you know, them perceiving the government of Canada as being friend or foe, which is what Francis was alluding to, uh, although in Canada, as you know, in emerging markets, we have a huge presence of, uh, in the extractive sector. And, and, and often when you try to engage with, with, with indigenous groups, um, they start off from the premise that, uh, you know, Canadian companies are doing wrong uh, and, and, and encroaching into their lands. So, so sometimes it's, it's a tough going from, from the start. Um, Peru had a great, speaking of, you know, just um, sp shedding the spotlight on, on some of the great work done by other people. Uh, Peru had the great idea of, of hiring a local indigenous person uh, as an intern. And that person's been accompanying them and, and working with their FPDS section and the trade section and writing reports. Um, and, and I found that to be very illuminating and something we're gonna try to copy here in Colombia. I, I think I can, I can certainly do our calls. Uh, our FPDS section can write reports about indigenous groups and human rights, but having a, a natural indigenous person write it from and see it from their lens, I think is something really interesting. And this to some extent echoes a comment that Francis made about um, recruitment, uh, and you know, there's a there's an FS campaign now, um, and and I hope that we are going to get more Indigenous people into the FS ranks, um, Tammy. Um, I, I think that's something we need uh, at every level, and and maybe and also at our roles, more funding for sure to continue to uh, go deeper into those Indigenous communities in Canada to get to know them better. Um, and, and here, you know, because we're rotational, which which Sarah just mentioned, um, I my dream is really to have a, an LES uh, who who can inherit the file, and provide more continuity and, and a sense of 
um, a longer term relationship uh, into this stock because I'm, I'm the one who's currently doing it and I'm going to be gone in a year. Um, and, and I hope, yeah, so that's, I guess I'm going to stop there. Uh, but but uh, I, I just want to say thank you. I've been taking notes and uh, it, it's been really, really valuable. Thanks, Claudio. Gary, you have a comment. You have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Tammy. Thanks for organizing. I just, uh, not a question, but just a big thank you to everybody. It's so nice to see friends and familiar faces on this call. Um, this is not an issue that we discuss here in Tokyo. So I, you know, I'm uh, I'm gonna I've took lots of notes. I'm gonna pass this to um, our network here, and that's over you know that's over 40 trade commissioners. Um, and you know, there's an indigenous population here in Japan, and I think there's um, there's a lot that can be done, and I think the work that you are all doing is, is very inspiring. Uh, so hopefully we can inspire some folks um, in our network here to to be in touch and and to you know do similar things uh, in the Japanese market. But just a big thank you to everyone. Thanks. Is anybody else? Um... Oh, okay. Come Hello, up. Tammy. Oh, hi, Ronan. Hi, sorry, I couldn't put my uh, my hand up. I can't That's find okay. it. That's um, okay. Um, very, very quickly, I have to run because I have another call that uh, that just started. I just wanted to thank you for organizing that, and it's indeed great to see some uh, some faces that we haven't seen for a long time. Um, I'm in Hong Kong. There's no indigenous population here. Um, however, I heard Nicole, and we're doing quite a bit in terms of. Um, uh, ag food, uh, manufactured foods, consumer goods, notably cosmetics and fashion. So I have two TCs working for ag, and one of them is also responsible for consumer goods. We have seen a couple of um, indigenous uh, companies uh, in the past 12 months, but we're doing, uh, as I mentioned, we, we're doing uh, quite a bit of promotional activities with local uh, local. Um, Supermarkets and local local uh, chains here, so we'd be we'd be willing to chat with Nicole uh, potentially um, before next fiscal year. So that was uh, I think that was a great uh, great conversation we just had today. On that, I really have to run. So bye everybody okay. and Thanks, uh, see you around, see you around the world somewhere. Bye. Yeah, have a good weekend. Uh, Francis, you have your hand up, and then Jerome. Sorry, me. Yeah, oh, your hands you up. Off. No. Okay. <laughs> Euh, je voulais juste faire un autre point en ce qui concerne, euh, en ce qui concerne les... Euh, on reçoit beaucoup de messages en tant que CDS, on comprend la situation, euh, pourquoi on fait ces efforts-là au Canada, puis on reçoit ces messages-là. Euh, puis ça, ça va... C'était pas quelque chose qui était difficile à vendre pour moi en Nouvelle-Zélande. Cette idée de, de, de s'engager avec des entreprises autochtones et tout ça, c'était vendu facilement à cause de, 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 de la nature de la Nouvelle-Zélande en tant que telle. J'arrive ici à Beijing, puis on a fait une, pour la journée de... Ah, oh, shoot, comment ça s'appelle? Euh, le, le 30 septembre dernier. Euh, la, uh, la, la, la... Day of Reconciliation. Uh... Yeah, I forget, j'oublie le nom yeah. exactement. Okay. On a fait un événement ici à l'ambassade, puis Beijing, on est quand même 300 personnes. Euh, et avec les CBS, les LES, euh, bon, l'ambassadeur parlait, euh, on a montré des films et tout. Euh, je sentais les CBS comprenaient ce qui se passait, les LES du tout. Et puis ça, ça va changer. C'est très différent d'un marché à l'autre. Euh, comme je disais en Nouvelle-Zélande, they get it. The LES will understand. Here, not so much. So there's a lot of work to do to sensitize your teams, whether you're in Europe and you know it, it's or, or in Asia. It's really different. I, I, can, I guess that perhaps in Latin America and Central America, people, your LES will understand it a bit more. But if they're not exposed to indigenous issues in their own country where they grew up, uh, there's a lot of work to do from our part to try to educate our team. So that's just the point I wanted to make. Jerome? Uh, I know we're beyond time, so I'll try to keep it short. Complètement uh, d'accord avec Francis. And I think what we need to do, and that also goes with the, the point that CJ made in the chat, I think we needed more access to training for our staff as to what the reality of First Nations is and, and how we can work better with them. And 
I've raised that with HQ. It didn't go anywhere. I'm going to keep bugging because I think that's sorely needed. And even me currently, so I, I, I'm acting home and what I'm doing for the home network in the US, I'm trying to get that friend I was mentioning earlier, the Canadian one, uh, to come and speak and, and, and talk to them about what the reality is for her tribe of working with the federal government and how that reality will be drastically different if you're talking about another tribe because some of our homes don't know that. And so they need to hear it directly. And I wish we had something more structured. Okay, j'arrête là. Merci beaucoup. Um, yes, CJ also commented about the Fed Prov, the f connection, and that you know it, it's always the ROs who uh, are sort of taking up the the torch. Are the provinces? Are we seeing anything coming from the provinces in Canada? Are they involved? Do they care? I mean, Jerome's like, eh, depends. <laughs> depends who it is. It's like, ça dépend des provinces. Euh, mm -hmm. J'ai de l'expérience de positive avec l'Alberta et avec la Colombie-Britannique. L'Ontario et le Québec, rien. So, ça dépend vraiment des provinces. I, I could just add, because I remember when I was um, briefly with the Ontario government, they did have more of a focus, but then the government changed. And so it's the same kind of idea, you know, they're they're subject to their political forces. So I'm wondering if our own FedProv division can't do more coordination from between the federal level and the provinces to say, you know what, we need to have some consistency across the country in how we support indigenous businesses. And instead of all of this variation across the across the across the country. I think that would be a nice dream. We'd all like to see that happen, to have more coordination. Um, it, yeah. it does. And, you know, right now, this is, you know, we, we suffer as well. It's whatever's the hot topic du jour. You know, you get a new government and they decide that something else is important. Uh, you get a new minister who suddenly decides they're all about Africa and you can jump up and down in Latin America and they don't even look at you so you know you're you're a bit at the mercies of uh who's making the big decisions at the top but uh i think it's something we keep raising and i think as you said education of us as trade commissioners of our local staff and getting away from like what's the kpi on that if i if i can't copy 15 srs then i'm not doing it because here in Costa Rica, and well, less Central America, there's indigenous populations, but they're not at the business level. You know, they're not there yet, but we can start building those relationships. We do have a CFLI project with an indigenous group here. They're more about community building, activism. Um, you know, they're persecuted here. They're run off their land. They are occasionally shot, you know, by, people who want their land. So there's a focus on that. But I think if we create that that relationship, that maybe in 10 years, they'll be ready to do something. But sometimes we get caught up in the KPI. Oh, how does that fit in strategia? I can't put that in trio. Uh, you know, that's so, and we only have so many hours in a day and, you know, our resources are limited. Everything's slashed to the bone with money. So it's a challenge. Um, Tammy, I would just I wanted to give a plug for, you know, BPE has done a wonderful job, yeah. at, at least for us to act as sort of the coordinating function at, at HQ um, between the various Canadian organizations. So when I went to them That's and good. said, I, I tend to always be working with this one group, what other groups exist? Like, are there other groups I can be doing these things with to sort of widen our network? Um, and they've also acted as a really nice liaison with um, Asia Pacific Foundation. Um, you know, just to have a buffer between the organizations and, you know, expectations wise. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I know they're stretched in all different ways in terms of inclusive trade. And then TCT um, is always looped into whatever reports I'm sending up to on, on the Indigenous side. So I know there's help, but I agree with um, CJ, we've got to be doing a, a little bit better job at it. Um, some of the provinces were involved in our last uh, uh, CABC mission. Um, but more on the technical like EDC side, just sort of how can we help out? We just want to be a part of it rather than participants, I would say. Okay. Brian, you have your hand up. Hi, folks. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
You sound like you're a bit in a in a tunnel, but that's okay. We can hear you. Uh, no, this has been very educational. I'm really just listening in to inform myself uh, better on what's going on on the on the TCS side. Um, my interest is trade policy. Um, you know, looking forward to uh, more conversations with the. the I'm in ASEAN, our uh, mission to ASEAN and Jakarta, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So, you know, we have a trade policy dialogue. But as we move towards the hopefully the launch of uh, FTA negotiations with ASEAN. Uh, there's a desire, of course, on the Canadian side to have a lot of uh, inc inclusive and sustainable development topics as part of that conversation, which is kind of, on one hand, very unfamiliar to ASEAN as trade policy, but very familiar in many other ways as um, social and domestic economic issues. So this has been really educational for me. And Sarah, thanks for your comments uh, about BPE and TCP. I guess just my question, Pam, picking up on what you said about changes in government, uh, you know, we don't have a new government and, you know, we don't have a new minister, so can we expect uh, continuity and kind of doubling down on what we've done so far? Uh, who's got their crystal, the who's got their crystal ball out? Uh, <laughs> I would say we hope so. We we were asking for uh, minister for Mint to get engaged with Central America for months and months, and she finally did. And we were like, oh no, if we get a new minister, we're gonna have to start all over. So we're hoping that things will like we kind of can continue the momentum we were building with the keeping the same minister, but uh, it's really hard to say which direction things will go. Governments uh, have their own agendas that we we have to kind of be flexible in. What was the old buzzword? Nimble. Nimble was the word we used to use all the time. But I think today's been great. We have some good contacts now. We know uh, if we need advice, we know who we can give a yell to. And uh, Francis, do you have a, something you want to add in? Yeah, um, so I, I guess we're about to close the session, but uh, first off on the change of governments, I sincerely hope, of course, of course we have to respond to ministers and their priorities, but whatever the government is, it should not change the work that we do in this field. Perhaps there'll be less focus if there's a change of government, but us as trade commissioners and foreign service officers, I think our first role is to find ways for the benefits of Canada as a whole. And this is one of them. No matter which government's in place, federal, provincial, whatever, I think it's good the effort that we're doing, that we're, <clears throat> the efforts that we're um, yeah, doing across the world, it should continue no matter what the government is. So that's the first thing. And the second thing before we close, I would like to have something to come out of this conversation. And I'm not sure, perhaps, uh, because uh, Jerome, what you were saying, you were trying to push on certain issues. Um, I was working closely with Sarah. Um, back in my days in, in Auckland, and we were pushing the same buttons at the same time would be good to see what others are doing. So perhaps a teams group that could be put together that we can say, look, I, I found this, I found this just, just for those who are interested, it doesn't have to be, you know, but let's say I found this company, you know, beyond trio, you know, I found this company or this organization in Canada is really useful, has got great contacts. Hey, look, you should talk to the, indigenous affairs person at TD Bank, right? So we can have a, a, a repository of this types of info so we don't have to reinvent the wheel because we're moving, different, we're going to different places all the time. That's just a suggestion, but I would, have, I would be happy to, uh, to lead that effort. I think we see lots of thumbs up on that. I think, uh, you and, know, and just on, on that time, if I may, um, just today I was exchanging with BPE and I echo Sarah that they're doing a great job. And um, really, I was inquiring about uh, missions and um, current strategies and initiatives related to Indigenous trade. And they, she gave, they, they gave me a really, really comprehensive response, um, attaching some, some reports of, of uh, recent Indigenous trade missions. And uh, I was wondering where was all this, you know, because I, I was not on the distribution list. And um, 
uh, it's it's all extremely useful intel. Um, so um, I don't know if there's a wiki uh, that BP has put together focused <laughs> on the indigenous trade, but otherwise this this team's group that Francis is suggesting uh, would also be a good vehicle, in my opinion, to, to share best practices. There, there is a wiki. Um, there is? I, I, okay. But is it a repository of documents or does it have like the latest mission reports and things like that? I don't remember. I don't yeah. think it has yeah. all of that kind of information that you're mentioning. I don't though. think so. And, yeah. But like we have, we have a team group in clean tech, for example, right? Why don't we have like a teams group on, on indigenous businesses? Okay, no, Both I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah, it's, it's not going to be for everyone, but for those who are interested and want to explore it, it's a, it's a good place to touch base with people who have, the, who have the experience and who can give you, at least point you in the right direction sometimes, uh, just to give you at least, this is the right person to talk to, and then you can run off and, and, and do your own thing. But uh. so, so Tammy, if you can let me know the people who were part of this conversation this morning, let's yeah. start with that. And I'm happy to start a, um, you know, a team's group and people can join and if they want to, okay. or, or perhaps, perhaps it's BPE's job to do it, but I, I don't have a preference. Sometimes, sometimes we just have to, uh, you know, jump in ourselves and not always wait for some uh, fear, someone to do it for us. So I can help I, get the setup, Tammy. Okay. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. Um, when I when I arrived in um, Canberra, I really wanted some troubleshooting help on, you know, the STC side. And if I didn't have Francis and Marc Andre and Ladon, I think I would have been underwater in minutes. And it made me realize, like, why don't we have these little sort of mini STC groups for troubleshooting and help? And I was referring a client the other day, and the new STC, one of the new STCs in Europe, emailed me, and she's like. Like, I'm terrified. I have a similar size mission to your, like, what do you do for budgets? And, and, you know, how do you deal with this? And so I, you know, I punched out this big response back and I'm like, hey, call me anytime. Like I was where you were <laughs> not too long ago as well. So I, I love any sort of groups we put together that it's, um, we're not recreating the wheel would yeah. be enormously helpful. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, I think we're, we're getting to our time. Um, Nicole mentions RO diversity champions as well, who might uh, be interested. And now oh, she is a, a star list there. So thank you everyone for joining. For those of you who are almost finished your week, enjoy your last day before the weekend. We discovered a Canadian brew pub here in Costa Rica. They do craft beer in, in, and they're importing from Canada. So tomorrow, our Ham is uh, heading us all off for lunch. <laughs> we got to promote those Canadian businesses, guys. If it involves beer at lunch, well, that's the way life is. It's hard. But I uh, wish everybody a good weekend. And thanks for joining us today. And hopefully we can follow this up and really see some things happening, at least if not this fiscal uh, strategic, strategic time is coming. December's almost here. Time to put in those projects for next year. So, so have a good weekend, guys.